Is there geometric recursion? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I must confess that uh, this took me a little bit of guard because I am barely learning about geometric recursion and topological recursion. And, um, uh, and I learned, uh, to my own surprise on Friday, that I was speaking in a recursion conference. So uh, <laughs> this is... <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so this is vaguely related to recursion. Rather than telling you about geometric recursion for quantum theory geometry, I'll I will stress the aspects of quantum theory geometry that are formally similar to the aspects that appear in geometric recursion, and ask, I are these similarities uh, <coughs> enough? to try to carry on a program for a geometric recur recursion in toric geometry. Um, because several things are similar, and uh, these similarities could be enough to, to find some sort of geometric recursion in quantum toric geometry. But I don't know. It's the, this is a question. This is a question mark. Uh, so I'll describe this. Uh, I'll stress these similarities. And this is joint work with Ludmil Katsarkov, uh, uh, Laurent Merseman, and Alberto Verkhovsky. OK, so this is the talk in one slide. So I'll tell you the talk in one slide, and then I will go describing slowly the different characters uh, in, the, in this story. So well, this is classical toric geometry. So what is classical toric geometry? Classical toric geometry, you, you have this variety. Say right now there is projective normal, etc., over the complex numbers. You have this variety that is an equivariant compactification of a complex torus. So you have this d dimensional complex torus, and then you have this equivariant compactification. And this is the toric variety. This is x. And there is a real torus inside this complex torus, R, uh, S1 cross S1 cross S1 cross S1, and this uh, produces a Hamiltonian <coughs> action. Uh, in the, the, I'm thinking about the Kähler case, say. So uh, this is a Kähler manifold and it has a symplectic form, and this is a Hamiltonian action, and so there is a moment map. Uh, and the moment map, well, the image of the moment map is a convex set, but it's more special than just any convex set because it is just an equivalent compactification of a torus. It is a polytope. In the Keller case, we have this polytope. And this polytope has some combinatorics of the polytope. That is not the geometry of the polytope. It's just the poset of the combinatorics of the polytope. And some geometry, because it's a, poly a rational polytope. It's inside QD. Uh, and uh, well, the inverse image of a point gives you an integrable system. The, uh, uh, this gives you an integrable system, the inverse image of a point. It's a real torus uh, of an adequate dimension, depending on the stratification of the polytope that you are, uh, that the point is living on, and so you have a real torus. Uh, and this Lagrangian tori, and you have this complex torus, and the complex, and this is the classical torque geometry in the, in the nicest case. Let me call the combinatorics of P G. Let me call it G, the combinatorics of P. I know it's a weird letter, but I, I insist. Uh, I want to stress the similarities with geometric recursion. OK, so what, what we do in quantum toric geometry is we quantize this picture into a quantum integrable system. So now we have a complex quantum tori, quan complex quantum torus, rather than a just a complex torus. We have a quantum torus here. And we parse. Huh? It's holo this is uh, this is holomorphic as you will see. This is a complex quantum torus. Yeah, holomorphic. Also, holomorphic variables do not commute. Huh? Holomorphic variables do not commute. Yeah. yeah, they do not commute. They do not commute. So it's a non-commutative space. <coughs> it's a, qu uh, a complex quantum torus, and uh, when you compactify it, and then you get a quantum toric variety, and you also have the moment map. 
and uh, now you get a polytope, but now it's no longer in QD, the polytope. Well, it could be in QD, but not necessarily. It's in RD. It's a, it's a possibly irrational polytope, and, uh, but it's still convex, and it still has combinatorics. If you just deform the situation a little bit, it has the same combinatorics, exactly the same combinatorics. So uh, the inverse image of a point now is a real quantum torus, and the we quantize this picture. Now we have quant uh, everywhere, eh, in every, here we have a real uh, torus acting in Hamiltonian fashion, here we have a real quantum torus acting in Hamiltonian fashion. This is a, in the best case of the polytope, of course there is a fan and whatnot, but in the nicest possible case, this is a non-commutative Kähler uh, space, and it has a symplectic form, and has this moment map, and uh, this is the image of the moment map. So we went from rational polytopes to irrational polytopes. Uh, and now, uh, well, but now you can the for uh, now you have this h bar uh, this this parameter this the the formation parameter, and you can deform without changing the combinatorics. You can deform the the toric variety into so source of directions, and then you can get the modular space of all uh, such toric varieties that share these combinatorics. Uh, and so we have here the modular space. The modular space is an complex uh, orbifold in the best possible of cases, as I will explain. It's a complex orbifold. The rational points, so th there is this kind of uh, integral structure in the modular space, and the rational points are the classical toric varieties. These are the rational points, because, well, the polytopes are rational. The, the rational points are the classical toric varieties. The irrational points are the quantum, truly quantum toric varieties. And the modular space has two indices, a G and an N. The G is the combinatorics of the polytope. And the N is some mark thing. I will mark points in the polytope, in the fan. I will explain. But I will mark some points. So we have an MGN, where N is some mark stuff. And G is a combinatorial stuff. So here, in 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 geometric recursion, at, at least in the simplest cases that I'm thinking about, we have M G N, and notice that uh, that topologically the uh, well, if it was a compact Riemann surface, the G would determine it's a combinatorial thing. It's just one number in this case, just a discrete thing, just one number that determines the topology of the of the Riemann surface, and it's one in this indi this index is kind of combinatorial. Let me call it, and this index let me call it marked. <coughs> let me call it marked. It's you you put this thing to improve the m smoothness properties of the modular space. You don't put it is worse, and here is the same situation. We, we mark more stuff; it gets nicer and nicer the modular space. It, uh, if we don't mark anything, it's really very bad. It's not even an orbifold. It's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a bad modular space. Think of quantum tori and the modular space of quantum tori. If you don't mark anything, it's a bad space. But if you mark stuff, it improves. And when you mark enough stuff, there's some bounds there, then you get an, a complex orbifold and a nice one. I, I'll explain the case of Pn, uh, what exactly the formula for this orbifold is. Uh, and so, well, you have these modular spaces, MGN, and you have in geometric recursion these modular spaces, MGN. But not only that, we r the in our construction, we really have a tag Muller space of the historic varieties. Uh, and the analog of the mapping class group is an arithmetic group. It's much simpler than the mapping class group. It's much simpler than the mapping class group. Because everything historic, the group is not as large. It's a essentially GLNZ or something li like that. Uh, uh, and so we have a tag Miller space uh, that is an open set of a complex vector space. In fact, this thing is toric, T is toric in our world. Uh, it's an affine toric variety. Uh, 
and it has an arithmetic group acting on it, and then you you get this this uh, modular space. So the obvious question in this workshop, uh, in this conference, is whether there is enough similarities between these modular spaces, formal similarities between these modular spaces and these modular spaces, to allow for a geometric recursion algorithm to run in this situation. Uh, so that's the question that I wanted to present. And now I will uh, describe the different characters of this in a rather schematic fashion. OK. So first, the quantum torus. Uh, well, uh, some of you know this much better than me and know it very well. But some of you may, may want to, to rem re recall your, uh, rem uh, that I remind you what, what, what I mean by this. So uh, let's think the simplest case. We have R2. And we have the all the parallel lines with a slope h bar uh, inside R2. All you I see this first as a foliation and then as a group action of R in R2. Then I descend and I get T2. And then, uh, and, uh, and well, if I take this transversal to the foliation, uh, to divide T2 by the foliation or by the group action is the same as to divide this one by the rotation h uh, h bar so we have we have t2 by the real line action uh, if it was a rational h bar well the leaves of this foliation would be torus knots then snower and it would be just s2 crosses two s1 crosses one divided by s1 and so I would get S1, if it was a rational H bar, because they would close on themselves the leaves. But if it is irrational, every leaf is dense everywhere. And the quotient is a non hausdorff uh, space, T2 divided by this group action. That is a non-compact group acting on T2. And uh, well, from this picture, one can get the, the uh, what m most people understand as the non-commutative torus. That is a, a non-commutative quotient. Uh, from this, one can get an algebra. And this is the algebra that one gets. And in this talk, h bar is always real. It's always real. Uh, h bar is always a real number. I, I, the situation is interesting when we allow h bar to be complex, but not today. So h bar is real. And we have xy equals yx times this. The, and this is the non-commutative quotient. It's meant to be the uh, space of functions on the space of leaves of this foliation, on this space, on this non hausdorff space. This is meant to be the non-commutative space of functions on this non hausdorff space. So that's one way to do it. But what we'll, we'll do, uh, and I just said this to connect to the non-commutative torus that many of you uh, know, but what, what we will do is we'll think of this as a stack on, a, on the side of toric uh, affine varieties. So what I mean by this is our quantum torus that uh, preserves all the information of, of, the, of this quantum torus. It has all that information is equivalent in this case. Uh, our quantum torus, what we will do is we will take uh, the stack, the quotient stack, T2 by this group action. That is the same as the quotient stack, S1 divided by the action of the rotation that is the same as the quotient stack taking the logarithm r divided by the what we call the quantum lattice one comma h bar uh, uh, is the, the additive subgroup generated by one and h bar think that h bar is the square root of two for example then this additive subgroup of r will be dense in r and it will be well, w what happens when you go around and around and around and around uh, all the all the points that you touch uh, when this leaf cuts the transversal and you take the logarithm, you lift to the real line. So you have this, we call this a quantum lattice. Some people call it a quasi lattice. So we have this quasi lattice, we have these reals, and we complexify now uh, in the very natural way. We take C divided by this quasi-lattice. 
uh, or quantum lattice. Notice that I'm putting the index 1 and not 2. Uh, and uh, uh, because I'm taking the transversal, I, I will index it with 1. But this is meant to be the two-dimensional torus, although I index it with 1. OK, well, how do we go do this in higher dimensions? What we do in higher dimensions is we take now any finitely generated <laughs> additive <laughs> subgroup of Rd, and we call that the quantum lattice. We take any finitely generated additive subgroup of Rd. And this is all the information we need to produce a quantum torus. The quantum torus in, re in logarithmic representation is Cd modulo gamma. Cd, this is Rd, where this quantum lattice lives. And this is the complex torus, Cd modulo gamma. And this is what I mean by the, this is what I'm going to compactify. This quantum torus, in the past, uh, the complex torus was unique in dimension d. Now we have a whole bunch, a moduli of quantum torus in dimension d. So that's what we, uh, this is what we're going to compactify. This is the definition of the quantum torus. Well, almost the definition. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. But, uh, well, and uh, here we have an example of uh, 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 quantum CP1. What we want to do is to add two points to this quantum torus. That is uh, C modulo gamma. Remember, we're working on the transversal here and the logarithm of the transversal that is equivalent to this. So, uh, again, I have C modulo gamma. This is gamma is the quasi lattice generated by 1 and h bar. And, uh, well, uh, by the exponential, this is C star exponential of gamma. And this is the upper hemisphere. The here I can compactify on one side this torus. And then this quantum torus, I can compactify it on the other side. And then I can glue them by Z goes to the Z to the minus 1. Just like the classical CP1. And, uh, and this is CP1, say, H bar. This is CP1 H bar. Uh, of course, these two points uh, are very stacky points. It's a little bit unfair to write them as 0 and infinity. They have some uh, large stabilizer, each one of them. Uh, OK, so that's a, uh, one quantum torus for a square root of 2, for example. Anyway. Wh which category of stacks are you working on? In, in a second, this is the category of stacks, but l let me. Uh, let me <laughs> uh, so uh, now, if I have a quantum lattice, I can enrich the situation by putting it inside a fan. Now the fan, in the past, the fan had to land in the in the in the usual lattice. It was a lattice fan, and now it just has to have to land on the quantum lattice gamma. So we have a fan in the quantum lattice gamma. But in the past, if I had a ray, I could always took the primitive vector. Uh, it was already marked by these arithmetics, the primitive vector uh, in that ray. Now I have to give it this information. I have to choose a mark, a point in one of these rays. Uh, this is uh <coughs> this I could also have done in the classic case. I could have chosen any other point, and then I would get some stackiness out of the how many times the primitive vector I chose. I would have gotten some stackiness. Uh, and here, well, I'm getting some more stackiness, and I'll explain in what category of stacks I'm working. In the case, a fan can be rational or irrational, can be uh, simplicial, like in the past, can be complete, like in the past. <coughs> the, new only the only new condition is that it could be gamma complete or not. Gamma complete means that these mark points generate gamma. But it, this could happen or not happen. So uh, the simplest case is when it is gamma complete. And uh, of course, uh, it could come from a polytope or not come from a polytope. Uh, so this is the this is very similar to the classical case. The only new additional ingredient is the possibility of being gamma complete or not. Okay, what stacks? Uh, now I answer your question. Uh, so I will take the category of fine toric varieties over C with toric morphisms. And uh, so this is the category. And I, the, the stacks will live over A, uh, A for affine. C will be, because of complex, C will be the category of complex analytic spaces with a holomorphic action of a complex abelian Lie group with a Sarisky open orbit. 
uh, this doesn't need to be a torus, it could be Cn. It could be Cn acting on X. Is the open if you do analytic? Huh? Analytics are risky open sets. What does it mean? Complement to device? Yeah, complement to That's what I mean. Sorry. It's, uh, it's all I mean. Dense, dense open. Yeah, dense open, yeah. Dense. Yeah, uh, that's all I mean. Okay, so that's that. And, uh, well, uh, quantum toric stacks now, let me call them like that. The quantum torus, for example, uh, are of the form uh, X mod H, and they are a category. And the category, uh, for example, classical toric varieties will be stacks over A, obviously. And uh, he, this, is an uh, this is an example of, uh, well, uh, of the quantum torus, you know. We get uh, uh, equivariant on Rami 5 and analytic covers. And, well, <coughs> you can set, set them up like this. Uh, anyway, the uh, if you have a fan, the classical toric varieties, ha the fan gl gives you gluing data for the different charts. And this gluing data is exactly this what you need to produce uh, the sent data for the corresponding stack. So uh, a classical toric variety will be a stack over A. Uh, and I I here I give the example of CP1. Here I give the example of CP1. Just the one, Z to 1 over z is all you need to have the descent data to produce a stack array. And uh, y uh, the quantum torus stack well behaves like this, where z uh, with uh, you get gamma uh, is abelian, of course, uh, and then you take a gamma cover and then an equivariant map with z z d g gamma is acting on z d because it is a subgroup of z d. And these objects and these arrows gives you the stack over A. And th that's the way you see the quantum torus as a stack over A. Uh, but now, uh, 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 the, uh, what is convenient about these settings is that you can say Kähler, you can say these things. Uh, uh <coughs> well, um, uh, amorphism of these stacks ends up being essentially a linear map that preserves the lattices. So also it is convenient that you can translate back into a very concrete language of linear maps that preserve lattices and combinatorial language for the fun. As you, as you can imagine, we will prove, uh, it will be true that the category of quantum fans is equivalent to the category of quantum toric varieties uh, uh, with not, nothing marked. This is an interesting example though. Here we have a, a what this map uh, would mean. What would this map mean in this category? And here you can see it. It's suppose that you have this lattice. And so uh, we can do a, a commutative algebra or co a polynomials that are rational with respect to the lattice. That are rational with respect to the lattice. This is the simplest possible example. We have this lattice. We have this linear map. Goes to this linear map. Uh, so, uh, in the quotient stacks, this is what, the what this map will mean. So you can take poly. Huh? This is real multiplication. This is real multiplication. Yeah, you had told me. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I can do this commutative algebra with rational, r with respect to the lattice uh, polynomials. Okay, so uh, uh, let me give another example. A fine quantum torque stacks. A fine quantum toric stacks. Uh, uh, this is kind of a canonical form, you know, uh, of a chart. This is the canonical form of a chart for a quantum toric uh, stack. You get z to the d plus some extra thing, uh, uh, and this is the, the kind of the deformation parameter. This is the deformation parameter. If this extra thing landed in z to the d, you would be in the classical case. But now you have this deformation parameter, uh, and so this this stack that can be represented as subject blah 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 all that uh, is kind of the cla the given a one of these uh, straight i straight uh, cones you get this stack and this is the ones that you are going to glue uh, these are the ones that you are going to glue uh, to produce the global one okay so uh, 
and one can do this. Let me just go extremely quickly about this story, otherwise I won't get anywhere, but uh, if you have one cone like this, you can straighten it up. So you, if you had this cone in this position, you make it straight. Uh, you put it in canonical form, and then this gives you the cocycle to the descent data for the stack. So you can glue the different charts of the quantum toric uh, stack, and then you get the global stack and, and associated to the fan. So, uh, 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 for example, if you had a, a simplicial fan, then you could, uh, you, you could do this. I'm going to just say that you can glue them. This, this is meant to convey the fact that you can glue them. Example, say you have, uh, look, uh, one thing was this lattice, but this lattice gets a little bit more interesting. Now you have two things, uh, two h bars uh, in dimension one. In dimension one, uh, now you not only have one and the square root of two, you could have one pi and e or whatever. You have the two, two of these numbers. And then you produce this quantum torus dividing by this lattice. Uh, and then you glue by this uh, z goes to z to the a minus 1. And uh, you get the p1 ab, p1 ab, the uh, weighted projective space with these two real weights. Uh, if A and B are rational, uh, this is a weighted, classical weighted pressure space. It weights the minimum common multiple of the denominators of A and B, and Q and QA are the weights of, the, of this weighted projective space. But of course, there, uh, uh, there is many other cases, uh, depending on the transcendental uh, uh, relations between A and B. In any case, quantum P2 looks like this. Now uh, I could put uh, no more parameters than necessary, just this ray in any arbitrary rational direction. And I have these two real numbers. And then, well, we glue them. We, ha we can do these gluings with respect to the, to the gamma complete lattice. And uh, uh, the what is interesting is that the parametrization of the weighted projective space requires these arithmetics. And it's also interesting the following fact. Uh, here by hand, we can prove that the all, the it is all weighted projective spaces appear, and they appear if and only if the rational case, if and only if A and B rational. And all weighted projective spaces appear. But the proof is by hand and doing all these calculations that end up in this. Uh, even for Pn, I haven't been able to prove that I get exactly all the weighted projective spaces. And that, uh, because now the formulas are uh, uh, very complicated arithmetics. Much less for the general toric case. Uh, I have not uh, been able to prove that I get exactly these toric uh, stacks, stacks or whatever they are called. Uh, because of it becomes a complicated arithmetic problem, and I, ho I don't have a machine to deal with this uh, complicated arithmetic problem. But well, for P2 it is true, and I get exactly the, ration the rational ones are exactly the weighted projective spaces, and this is the parametrization. The weights are this. If you are given these two rational numbers, this is the parametrization. Okay. <coughs> In any case. Uh, uh, we now we will uh, turn on the the gerb, uh, the so-called uh, calibration. So what we do is uh, again it's a lot of letters, but let me explain what's going on. Uh, if we have the the, the classical story, we can think of uh, this thing as a foliation or as a group action. And the quotient, if I think of the quotient as a group action the of the quantum torus, that is T1 for me, uh, uh, as a group action, 
and the quotient as a foliation, well, they will differ in, in that, in, in the irrational case, they will be exactly the same. But in the rational case, this will acquire an asset stabilizer everywhere because this is like rather than a, this is a circle action and this is a real action so this is will acquire a set stabilizer everywhere so this will be a gerb uh, this will be classified to a map of bz if you want or this will be a gerb over this so uh, but in the irrational case is the same so it's more natural to always admit the gerb uh, to turn on the the jerk uh, and so well we we uh, and we can control the combinatorics if we insist in having a uh, uh, well once you have a lot of jerk because this is in dimension one but once you have a lot of jerk you may want to mark some of the components of this jerk uh, or not uh, but if you mark them what you mean is that in the morphism you you send the correct generator to the correct generator and then you desingularize the modular space. So, uh, so what is a calibration? Well, a calibration is uh, not to only have gamma, but to have it together with a morphism from Zn to gamma. So rather than only having gamma, you remember the fan, and you have the gamma, we're going to see gamma, we're going to choose some higher dimensional ordinary lattice and uh, see it as the image of H. And this is going to be our deformation parameter. H is going to be our deformation parameter uh, that's going to produce the modular space. The morphism from here that's, uh, that covers gamma. But of course, now we have the freedom of fixing, because they are not the generators now are numbered. Now we have the freedom of fixing some of them, marking them. Yeah, and uh, gamma zero consists of the irrational vectors, is that it? Uh, the possibly irrational ones, the possibly irrational ones. And now we, we can mark some of them. So they ha in morphisms, they have to go the, these combinatorics, you know, which ones we're going to mark. And we also can choose this lattice bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, so we can have more and more gerb here. Bz, et, 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 et. So, uh, well, uh, in any case, the calibrated one, once we have a calibration, is certain gerb of certain rank over the non-calibrated one. But now we can mark some of this gerb. And this is the, mar the analog to the mark points in the classical modular space. So, uh, so this is the calibration. We turn on the gerb. Uh, now uh, let's do the quantum geometric invariant theory. So now we have one of these quantum toric varieties that we have this uh, calibrated fan. We have this fan, uh, but now we have a calibration on for the gamma. Uh, and so once we have the calibration for the gamma, we can take the Gale transform. So it's uh, very used in convex geometry. Uh, it's just this. We just take a H of x, we see it like this, and we ask for these dual equations. It's just this. Uh, this is H, and this is K, where K is given by the A's. So this is called the Gale transform, and H yeah, um, is identity plus H bar. Uh, and anyway, once we do the Gale transform, we can get this open set in Zn, that is an affine toric variety, and <coughs> a Zn minus the action. You can think of it as a foliation if you want, and uh, well, uh, this is we took some sub some linear subspace uh, some coordinate linear subspaces away from z to z to the n, and we make this open set just in like in geometric invariant theory, and we have this action. But now it's the action of a non-compact group. You can think of it very often will be irrational, and, and the leaves will be dense in regions, 
and uh, this stack, this quotient stack, uh, is the calibrated toric variety. So this is the geometric invariant theory in quantum toric geometry. It's easy to describe it, but explicitly, it just generalizes the geometric invariant theory in toric geometry. It's very explicit. Uh, the non-calibrated thing is, again, you don't think of this as a group action, but you think of it as a foliation. If you think as, as a foliation, you take the holonomy groupoid of the foliation, you stackify the holonomy groupoid, and you get the non-calibrated toric variety. So it's the same story as here. The calibrated toric variety will be a gerb over the non-calibrated toric variety. But notice that the calibrated is more natural. It's more natural. In any case, uh, uh, if we take the uh, case in which we have a fan coming from a polytope and in which n minus d, this is n, and this is d, in which n minus d is even, the even case, we can always force the even case by adding more gerb. We can always add the even case by adding more gerb. Uh, then uh, uh, we can uh, interpret a quantum toric variety as a foliation on an LBM manifold. So what is an LBM manifold? Uh, well, <coughs> uh, if we get these n vectors in m-dimensional complex space, n is bigger than 2n plus 1, and it comes from dynamics. I, it satisfies two uh, conditions. The Siegel condition, zero is in the convex hull of all these complex vectors, and to the weak hyperbolicity condition, I, if zero is in the convex hull of lambda i, i has this cardinality, then we can produce an open set of z to the s m uh, by this combinatorial condition. And then uh, this, uh, this, uh, this will be invariant under this action. And its projectivization will give me a compact, complex, non kähler manifold. And they were, uh, this generalized the uh, Hopf. Uh, the Hopf is an example. Uh, in that case, P1 is S2, and N is S3 cross S2. And this is the toric variety, and this is the LBM manifolds, and this is the hop vibration times nothing, times the constant map. This is an example. This is the simplest possible example. And in general, uh, the calabi ekman vibrations of uh, S odd times S even, all the calabi ekman vibrations that go to products of projective spaces, are also examples of this, but this generalizes uh, the calabi ekman or this generalizes this to any toric variety. So it's like the default complex homotopy cover of the toric variety, <coughs> this complex manifold. So uh, we have this LBM manifold, and uh, this, <coughs> well, they can be generalized uh, a little bit more. Uh, asking, well, once we have the, once we have the action rather than the set, we have the action. What is the biggest sets in which this action is still free and proper? What is the biggest sets in which this action is still free and proper? And uh, this admits a combinatorial answer, and it's here. So this is the simplest case, but it admits a combinatorial answer, and the LBM manifolds come together with this combinatorial gadget. That is just a combinatorial gadget. This combinatorial gadget tells you the action on which set it should act. And this is the set in which it should act. That combinatorial gadget. This combinatorial gadget. OK, so that's, that's that. Uh, and then you get all these many, many, many folds. Here you need a pair. of You need the complex numbers plus the combinatorial gadget. In given the complex numbers I with these conditions, you have the combinatorial gadget for free, but you could have just the complex numbers plus the combinatorial gadget to produce all these manifolds. 
Uh, and these manifolds are the ones that are going to do this for all quantum toric varieties. Is the is the the generalization of the Hopf vibration for any quantum toric variety. In any case, uh, here it is the the action. Here is the action, and here is the foliation. That the n. So here we have the n. Here we have the n, and it comes with a foliation, and here you have the quantum torques. This is the foliation. Uh, these are the parameters. Or it can also be seen as a group action. If you want the calibrated case, you think of the group action. If you want the non-calibrated case, you think of the foliation. And this is uh, for even fans. And of course, we have the rational case and the irrational case. In the rational case, you recover all ordinary toric varieties. And in the rational case, you recover the more truly quantum non-commutative toric varieties. So that's the story. Uh, and this is the relation between the, these LB and B manifolds and the quantum toric varieties. Uh, the idea of the truth is what I have to tell you from a fan how to obtain the data to obtain an LBMB manifold. And there is an algorithm, as you would have expected. And the algorithm is a Gale transform. Essentially, you take the, de the datum from the fan, you do Gale transform, and then you do this step that I have no rational explanation for it. Uh, you just have A1 plus I A2. <laughs> you just make them, co uh, interpret them in a complex fashion. Uh, of this, I don't have a rational explanation. Uh, it just works. Irrational. <laughs> 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 uh, it just works, and then you get an LBMB manifold up here that does this job. Uh, so uh, it works. And you get these foliations. And they are holomorphic foliations. In the polytropal case, they are holomorphic foliations. So in the polytropal case, uh, and it has a transversal Kähler structure. It has a transversal Kähler structure. So this makes this into a Kähler stack over A. So this is the way to make this into Kähler stacks. Uh, now, module spaces. Uh, no, not too early. <laughs> module space. Classical toric varieties, as toric varieties, equivalently don't have moduli. They, they are all these rational points flying around. But now, if we add the quantum toric varieties, now they have a modular space. And let me start by the modular space of quantum torus. Let me start by the calibrated, uh, the calibrated case. Oh, oh, this one is the calibrated case. The calibrated case. If I uh, don't mark anything, if I don't insist that many order of these things is preserved, if I don't insist on marking on the uh, on the fan, on nothing, here there is no fan, but there is virtual rays virtual, uh, on the generators that come here. If I insist in not ordering anything here, not ordering preserving no nothing, then I, uh, this is the empty here. Well, I get this, uh, this uh, quantum tori, and the modular space is R d n minus d uh, by an equivalent relation, and the equivalent relation is horrendous. But one can calculate it but with linear algebra. And the only, the only nice thing I can say about this equivalence relation uh, is that it coincides with Riefel's equivalence relation in non-commutative geometry. So it, it really coincides with the modular space of the, of the Riefel-style quantum torus non-commutative geometry. So it's the same modular space, because the equivalence relation is the same. It's very non-obvious. But it can be computed in our case with linear algebra. Uh, uh, this didn't come out too well, but I can read it. But what if I insist that the order is preserved maximally? Then it's a so much nicer modular space. So this is the effect of marking the points, well, marking the calibration, uh, insisting on the order. Now I get that this much nicer, it's just essentially GLDZ, uh, and then this permutation group. It's very ni and the recurrent relation is super very nice. So it's the same story as in, as in the modular space MGN. If you mark things, it gets better. So it's a much better modular space. 
Now, what do I mean by the combinatorial type of a, what do I mean by the combinatorial type of a toric variety? Well, by the combinatorial type of a toric variety, I mean uh, the poset in the of the fan, if you want. Uh, so that this is a cone in the fan. Just fix that poset. This is the G in MGN. This is the G in MGN. It's the combina the poset of the fan. The poset of the fan. Okay. <laughs> so if I uh, say I have a, the gamma complete case. Uh, well, in the gamma complete case, uh, I get the theorem. This thing is a real, real orbifold of the expected dimension. Example P two. P two. P two. Example P two. P two. After you do all the calculations, you get these orbifolds. This is the modular space of P twos. With the simple, uh, without calibration, really, with just the simplest uh, situation, you know, not uh, gamma complete. So you get uh, this B a b goes to b a, and a b goes to one over b minus a two over b. So this is the orbifold. The only, the most orbifold the point is p two, classical p two. This is the most symmetric one. And then you get the uh, weighted predicted on the rational ones, and the m and you get all this. This is your uh, very simple orbifold, as you would expect. It's essentially a modular space of triangles or something like that, uh, but very specific setting here. Okay, uh, for P n, well, uh, we get the same. We get the. But here I can. Uh, we c can well we haven't tried too hard, but we haven't we cannot prove yet that exactly the weight of work space are exactly rational points. There is arithmetics there. Uh, now, what about the calibrated case? Uh, well, uh, now I'm going to allow myself calibrations, and of course this covers this. And it's a real orbifold. But what is interesting is that if I put enough calibration, make it, and put possibly vectors to make it even, then I get a complex orbifold. This is very, with this trick of A1 plus I A2. So it gets a magical complex structure coming from a trick. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, here the modular space with here uh, mark morphisms uh, becomes a complex orbifold. Omega essentially is the lambdas. It's a complex thing. And then uh, you have this becomes a complex orbifold for PD. Of course, it gets more complicated for the other toric varieties. And it has to do with the, if it was polytopal, or if it was a fan, it has to do, of course, with automorphisms of the fan. Uh, now, uh, if I take the modular space of LBMB manifolds, uh, they c these lambdas give me the sort of time Muller space that I promise. And, uh, and in general, if you put enough marking, uh, well, this uh, preserves the ho uh, homotopy type even for not enough marking. But for enough marking, you get this modular space. So you get this tag mirror space and you get this very simple well it's a complicated group but nevertheless very simple mapping class group and now you have all the ingredients to maybe <laughs> start uh, 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 here is the this is the combinatorial type of the fan of course uh, what matters here is n minus it looks like two integers but uh, like one integer so you could possibly start a, a, a geometric uh, recursion program here or something. I'm not sure this will make sense. I'm just saying that there is enough similarities to to consider that. Uh, well, let me switch very rapid, very 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 quickly to um, uh, ah yeah. To the chimeric story that is uh, related to this, but uh, but it also explains a little bit um, how to enrich this story 
to make a, to say do the Riemann rock theorem or in in this setting uh, do the Riemann rock theorem on all these things you know I want say I want to do to count the lattice points in the polytope and it gets hard because gamma is dense everywhere or something uh, so let me just say how the story continues and this is with the chimeric geometry that we have been developing uh, again it's Ludmil, Loran, all of us, uh, Ignacio Otero we have been developing this chimeric geometry so uh, let me just say very quickly what this ki chimeric geometry amounts to and what it tells me about the modular space that I just described so if I take the real numbers I could take the ring of all uh, maps from n to r, uh, namely real, uh, real valued sequences. And uh, I could take the ideal of those with finite support. Uh, this, this is due to Abraham Robinson. This is uh, the ones that have a finite support. And then I take m, the maximal ideal containing f. So, well, what do I get? What do I get? Uh, out of that, well, I get R mod M, and this is the field of the hyperreal numbers. Uh, I'm sorry, where's the ultra filter here? Well, uh, is this to have an ultra filter as to have a maximal ideal? Because essentially, it's the supports, uh, the ultra filter is the supports of the things in the maximal ideal. Yeah, well that's a choice. It's a choice. And you cannot make it. I cannot make it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> anyway, well. <laughs> anyway, this is a field. Say. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, oh yeah, here it is. Here it is. Sorry. Uh, so, this is the so called ultra filter. And, uh, the ultra filter is obtained by considering the uh, the supports of x that are not in m. So what's sigma again? Is the support? Ah, okay. uh, and the support of a sequence is, is the support is where it's not zero. Oh, okay. Yeah, the support is where it's not zero. So I, I get the supports of x that are not in m, and then I get these uh, these sets and the <coughs> set of sets, the set of sets gets confusing. The set of sets is an ultra filter and the same as, as a maximal ideal. So it satisfies these uh, five uh, properties or so. And they characterize the, uh, the, th the thing. And yeah, it is extremely puzzling, this story. Uh, uh, I forgot all this, my gosh. <coughs> <coughs> so, okay. In any case, we have this correspondence between maximal ideas and ultra filters. Uh, what is uh, surprising at first is that the field uh, of hyperreal numbers is linearly ordered. Is linearly ordered. Contains R, it's a field extension. And in the field of ultra hyperreals, <laughs> there is an epsilon, and it's a positive epsilon because this is ordered. So, uh, uh, two sequences, one is bigger than the other, if the set where one is bigger than the other, the support of the condition is not in the ultra filter, so, uh, just like here, uh, is not in the maximal ideal, or ultra filter. So, so there is this uh, this uh, set of infinitesimals inside these hyperreal numbers, and then there is a set of unlimited numbers too. That is the reciprocal of the infinitesimal. This uh, there exists an epsilon. There exists many epsilons, so th bigger than zero, but less than every positive real. So there exists the infinitesimals and the unlimited numbers. The limited numbers form a ring, and uh, but not as a field because uh, because of this because it is uh, the limited numbers include the epsilons and the inverses are not there. Uh, but anyway, they form a the limited numbers. 
uh, form a uh, ha have a form a ring and the a maximal ideal is the infinitesimals and the reals is the field uh, the limited module of the infinitesimals that's the real numbers of course and this is called the so-called uh, standardization or shadow map uh, you uh, forget the infinitesimal part it's essential you just forget the infinitesimal, uh, infinitesimal part uh, so the limited numbers are num o usual numbers plus infinitesimal numbers, and the shadow you just forgets the infinitesimal part. Can you just kind of abstract sort of instead of the like surreal numbers or asymptotic series kind of like hard rings, which are concrete objects in a sense, and it has the same properties? Yeah, well, this. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. It's something which you can really work with, yeah. It's like asymptotic expansions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There is, uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we started with this. <laughs> yeah, we started with this. <laughs> but in any one of these frameworks, what I will do really, really works in any one. Surreals are probably the really the place where I should be working. T this is true. The surreals is really. Well, you tell me what uh, because, uh, but I really should be working on the surreals uh, because we want. Because here uh, it can get very complicated. You, ne we, you need stars and stars of stars, uh, and in the surreals you don't. Uh, but we ru really should be working in the surreals. This is totally true. Uh, but anyway, well, I, I just chose this particular one because it's popular. Uh, uh, it's a non-standard model, see? Uh, and so we have... Uh, this is an example of what you can do with this. If you have an infinitesimal and you subtract the, you have a function, you have an infinitesimal, you subtract the value of the function, you divide by the infinitesimal, and you take the shadow map, you get the derivative, if the derivative existed to begin with. Uh, and this is for any infinitesimal. So uh, the, the motto here is that the kind of the calculus becomes algebra, and we want to do algebra. So the, to do the calculus, we want to do the algebra. So calculus becomes algebra. Notice that I uh, just talked about maximal ideals and all this and all that, and all of a sudden I have the derivative. Uh, 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 this one is unique, if and only if the continuum hypothesis uh, that you may like or not like. Uh, <coughs> and the field is non Archimedean. Uh, in any case, we can do it for the reals, and the rationals, and the integers, and the natural numbers. Uh, and for us, is, uh, this one is important because we will need these lattices. For us, this one is important because we will need these lattices. And in any case, uh, I mean, uh, notice that uh, every infinite natural number in a way is uncountably large. In a way, it is uncountably large. In any case, well, there is objections to this. Uh, Alan Kahn doesn't like it. In '95, he called it inadequate. Um, but in 2000, he called it chimera. Uh, and so we have taken this name. And we call it uh, chimeric toric geometry, what we will do now. So, uh, uh, yeah, well, he's right. <laughs> I mean <laughs> anyway, we will use it <laughs> and we will call it chimeric torque geometry. What did the last sentence say? The end, the end of the rope for being explicit. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. so I mean, you can say that about the real numbers. You can say that about the real numbers. <laughs> Maybe only the rational the numbers, numbers exist. Sequences of rationals up to sequences which converge to the But let me very quickly just say you can do some algebraic geometry. We have been working on it. Uh, uh, and you for example, you can prove the fundamental theorem of algebra where n is an infinite integer number. So you can prove these kind of things. You can prove chimeric Bessou theorem. The whole point is that the polynomials are of infinite degree. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. So we can prove these theorems. And now we have chimeric Bessou theorem and chimeric la la la. And now we have chimeric theorem varieties. This is the point, of course. Uh, because now this irrational ray does land on a primitive vector. And uh, 
and now we have all this this is w to the square w to the square root of two well in re in the chimerization given by the continuous action expansion becomes w to the m over n where m and n are infinite natural numbers so we can do these chimeric toric varieties and of course now the fan could have an, a hyper finite number of cones so it the polytope could look like a circle the polytope could look like a circle of course it's a particular chimerization of the circle because the circle has many possible chimerizations and uh, well let me just say uh, yeah this uh, we have proved that uh, the I think this is the opposite way uh, well, that the quantum toric varieties uh, are a subcategory of the chimeric toric varieties, and, uh, and you can also have this shadow map, this forgetful functor shadow map from the chimeric toric variety. So now you can run Riemann Rock and do all these things uh, that it was very puzzling to do without. It was very hard to count the points in the in the polytope when the gamma was a quantum lattice, but now we can count them and we can write Riemann rock and we have chimeric homologies and uh, ship cohomologies and sequences and this and we can do for example Riemann rock but all uh, and then go back by the shadow map to the usual world and say very interesting things about say for example the original these foliations that people have studied the lbm foliations and whatnot <coughs> Uh, using just usual algebraic geometry. Uh, now we can use just usual algebraic geometry. Chimerized. Can, can it have yeah, it's it's <laughs> uncountable <laughs> dimension. Yeah. It's uncountable dimension Riemann rock. Uncountably dimension Riemann rock. Okay. So that's all for now. Thank you so much. Spaces can you consider all possible uh, multi-layer evaluations and blah blah blah. So it's organized virtualization of Bergdorf geometry mm -hmm. and a little bit of non Hausdorff stuff, mm -hmm. but really kind of like Adic. Iter iterated over groups for mm -hmm. it's called Adic spaces. It's a big story about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Where I think developed this. Mm -hmm. thing, yeah. yeah, and uh, return to think, yeah. Uh, uh, no, I, I mean this whole this quantum. Stuff. I, I thought uh, many, many years ago about uh, some geometry when you get compact manifold with uh, foliation transversal holomorphic structure. <coughs> and these are presumably examples, and there are also similar story with we get various quotient. And the main thing is that sometimes we can get hot structure for those guys, and it will be interesting, like uh, hot structure cohomology of JLN Z. Uh, I, I can explain you later. So mm -hmm. yeah, well, so I. I in the guest correspondence, one can go beyond Shimura varieties to this case. Uh -huh. so seems to look very well. Mm -hmm. Well, I need to hear that, you know. Yeah. Let me just write not to for myself here a little note. Yeah. That's great. Fantastic. So I, I, I need to hear. And yes, the, yeah, really, we should be working on the surreals because I was very schematic here, but we need to start taking the stars, and this gets very unwidely. Yeah. And all of them land inside the surreals. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there is this uh, there is this announcement that I haven't seen the final proof, but it's a very respected guy that that says that in a way taking the stars forever gets you the surreals. It's taking the stars forever. Uh, so the surreals are the canonical objects because taking the stars are like choosing coordinates. Every ultra filter is kind of a choice of coordinates, but you really should go all the way to the surreals. And Tim has been teaching me a lot of this stuff. So. I have a question and it sounds like a joke. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't know if there is any connection between the surreal numbers here mm -hmm. and the alien derivatives of a car. Alien derivatives? Yeah. 
so this is this is an uncountable set of derivations on continuous functions, actually convergent in terms of convergence. It is. Uh -huh. Well, I don't know anything about alien derivatives at the moment, but I'll check it. Uh, it's uh, of course. Now we get all these uncountably many uh, derivations and whatnot, but, but we're really working on algebraic geometry. Uh, of course, when you shadow it, it has all this analytic. Uh yeah, but this, uh, no, the story is that the serials are, are um, there's a kind of big, big conjecture that serial map, serial, serials are exactly uh, um, like chemical complicated. Uh, Iterated exponentials, yeah. but with only real numbers. Yeah, and that's yeah, it's kind of complicated. Exponent to exponent, exponent, and all this other stuff, blah blah blah. <laughs> oh. so just the same serial numbers. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, lots of interesting questions. Yeah. yeah, I would just like to also comment that these spaces of ultra filters uh, can be used to kind of give expression to the notion of um, kind of irrational spectrum that you can you can um, uh, associate to certain uh, points in ultra in, in stone spaces of ultra filters you know real numbers for example and you can think of them as parameterizing you know um, ideals generated by real numbers so the stone space of ultra filters is kind of like uh, you know like a, a mo like kind of a model of a new notion of, uh, of scheme. That's one way to think of it. I wanted to um, ask you about these moduli spaces that you're getting. Uh -huh. Can you um, realize them as leaf spaces of uh, foliations? Because the sort of naive um, moduli space of quantum tori is essentially R divided by GL2Z. I, I'm in the wrong file, sorry. That's why it's so confusing. L let me just go back to the other one. Yeah, so, yeah, for example, so mm -hmm. you, there you have TS divided by GL. Mm -hmm. So suppose TS were R and you're dividing by GL2Z acting projective linearly mm -hmm. on R. So that's the leaf space of the Anasov foliation mm -hmm. of the unit tangent bundle mm -hmm. to the moduli space of uh, elliptic curves. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, these more general uh, moduli spaces of quantum toric varieties also um, appear as uh, leaf spaces, somehow of foliations, or transversals <laughs> of uh, foliations. It's a wild guess, but I think yes. And I think it has to do with the fact that I took H bar real ah. rather than complex. Ah. Uh, but I'll, I would have to think about it. But it's, it sounds like an interesting question. And I think the answer is yes, but I'm not sure. Right. But <coughs> so one thing that you, I guess, would want to, in order to try to answer your question from the very <laughs> beginning, is uh, answer the question like, what is a pair of pants? Well, you see, uh, uh, the all these fans are made of cones, and you can take a cone at a time. Yeah. Maximum doesn't think this. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that I, I don't know about that. It's not, it's uh, not the Mirzakhani argument. Yeah, yeah. Mirzakhani argument, I don't know any, uh, how it would go about it here at all, as Maxim is saying. But <coughs> still, it's made of cones. Well, uh, now we're questions. Uh, yeah, I think the speaker again. Thank you very much.